Chapter 9, Energy Balance. I want to start with defining obesity. We start by looking at a few measurements and then comparing them to the BMI chart. BMI, or Body Mass Index, is a calculation based on height and weight. Look at the chart on page 99 in your notes or for a more detailed chart on the back cover of your text. To figure out what an individual's BMI is, first look at the height listed in inches on a left-hand column. Then find the weight in pounds in the center group of numbers. These numbers will intersect at one of the numbers in the top row. As you can see, a healthy BMI is 19 to 24. A BMI of 25 to 29 is considered overweight, and a BMI of 30 to 40 is considered obese. Under 19 is underweight. For an example, let's take a woman who is 5 foot 8 inches um, and about 158 pounds. We can find 68 inches on the left hand column and then go across to find 158 pounds. This intersects at a BMI of 24. This is at the top end of the healthy range. It's important to realize that BMI is not the only tool we use to define obesity. For example, look at Mike on page 320. He's 6 foot 3 and 245 pounds. This gives him a BMI in the obese range. But at 8% fat, he is hardly obese. He's a bodybuilder with a lot of muscle. Muscle weighs more than fat, so muscular individuals typically have inaccurate BMIs. Waist circumference is the mo next most important tool in determining obesity. Visceral fat is the fat which accumulates around the abdomen. People with more visceral fat tend to have more of an apple body type. Accumulating body fat in this area is more dangerous to health because this type of fat is more mobile. It is constantly being utilized and then stored, increasing the amount of circulating LDL, which increases the risk for heart disease. We can't use BMI alone to determine obesity because two people of similar heights and weights could actually have completely different body profiles. To determine if someone is overweight or obese, and if it is a health risk for them, we need to look at these things. BMI, or height and weight, waist circumference, and associated health problems, and fitness level. To look a little more closely at the incidence of obesity, we can look at this chart, the most recent from the CDC. The charts in your book on page 312 show the data up to 2002. We can see here that in every state in our nation, at least 15% of the adult population is obese. 66% of our adult population is now overweight or obese, and 33% of our adult population is obese. These numbers are up and rising. You do need to know these numbers generally. In this chapter, you will learn that the energy in refers to food absorbed, carbohydrates, fat, and protein also alcohol, it's also energy. And the energy out refers to calories burned. Let's look a little more closely at the energy outside. This diagram, figure 9-5, shows the factors which contribute to the energy outside of the equation. BMR is basometabolic rate. This is the energy we use to maintain all of our resting activities. It ranges from about 50 to 65 percent of total energy expenditure although it has been reported as high as 80%. Even if you are sitting, watching this movie, seemingly not doing anything, your brain is hard at work trying to take in all this information. You are breathing, your heart is beating, your body is making enzymes and hormones, your cells are being broken down and built back up. All of this takes energy. The BMR will vary from person to person. How do you increase your BMR? The only way to do it is to gain muscle. Muscle is more metabolically active than fat at rest and requires more calories to sustain itself, even at rest. The thermic effect of food is about 5 to 10 percent of total energy expenditure. The thermic effect of food is the amount of energy your body uses to digest and absorb food. It takes energy to break down starch to glucose or break down protein to amino acids. It also takes energy to absorb and utilize these nutrients. Do some foods take more energy to digest, absorb, and assimilate? Absolutely. Protein definitely takes more energy to break down and absorb than carbohydrates. 
but it takes more energy to turn excess carbohydrates as glucose into triglycerides and storing them as fat than it does storing excess fat as triglycerides as fat. And certainly eating a piece of celery, breaking it down and absorbing its nutrients will take a few more calories of energy than eating a spoonful of sugar. But the range generally tends to be between 5 to 10 percent. Some reports are a little higher, but I wouldn't focus any diet trends on the specific aspect of energy expenditure. I would focus on physical activity. A range of 25 to 50 percent of our energy expenditure is from physical activity. Trying to find a physical activity which you enjoy is extremely important. Moving on to feasting and fasting. These charts on page 331 are a good summary of the information we've learned so far this semester. When a person overeats, we call this feasting. When we eat in excess, that means there are more energy yielding nutrients absorbed than needed for energy or other functions. Carbohydrates break down to glucose and are stored as glycogen in the muscle and the liver. Excess glucose is then changed to triglycerides and stored in the fat stores. Excess fat is broken down to fatty acids and is stored as fat. And excess protein is broken down to the amino acids and then converted to triglycerides and stored as fat. You can see the trend here. Anything in excess is stored as fat. When a person fasts or doesn't eat, the body starts breaking down the glycogen into glucose to use for energy. The fat stores are also being mobilized to use for energy as well. If the fat continues beyond a day, then all the glycogen stores are depleted. This time frame varies from person to person and the type of activity. But the body must draw on body fat for energy and body protein. Remember that we don't store protein, so the body must break down structures like blood protein and muscle and utilize this protein for energy. Protein can be broken down and converted to glucose to feed the brain, but the body would eventually consume itself if this continued. To accommodate for this, the body takes the fatty acids and changes them into ketone bodies, which the brain can use for energy. This process can take about 10 days. Depending on activity levels and the amount of fat on the body, a person can go without eating for about six to eight weeks. Okay, that's it for chapter five.